Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you all again this Lord's Day morning. To look to see, look into the Word of the Lord and see what He has for us this morning. Uh, I enjoyed so much uh, our Easter Sunday last week at, at our home assembly in Brantford. It was just so nice to be with all of our dear friends and family there this uh, past Sunday. We don't get to spend often a lot of time there at our home assembly in, in Connecticut. So when we do, it's always a joy to be around those folks and to, and to enjoy that time. In our evenings here, it's already been mentioned that we are going to take, we're taking a little bit deeper look in the Psalms. It's actually a look into Psalm 42 and maybe if we have time into Psalm 43. So all of our time will be taken up in looking at that psalm. Now, last week we spent almost our whole session giving a, a introduction, if you, if you will, to, to Hebrew poetry and how Hebrew poetry is structured and how it is used. And we looked at uh, um, the forms that are used. We looked at the different parallelisms that are used in Hebrew poetry. And I think those things are important for us to understand in our own personal study of of the word of God, especially when it comes to poetry and poetry consumes such a large portion of the word of God. You find poetry in almost every single book of, of the scripture, with the exception of, of just a few that we named last Sunday evening, and we won't spend any more time introducing the evening, but that's what we plan on doing in our evening sessions. In our morning sessions, we are planning to continue going through Psalm 42. I told Peter when when I was invited to come and he was asking me what we were going to do, I said, I'm going to preach on Sunday mornings and we'll teach on Sunday evenings. And so that's kind of the pattern that we're, we're going to be following as we go along. Psalm 42, please. If you haven't already turned there, turn to Psalm 42. Now, I'd like to read it this morning. Last week, I read it in the New King James Version. This morning, I'd like to read it in the New, in, New English Translation, a, a translation that I've grown to really enjoy. So I'm going to be reading in the New English translation this morning. And it goes like this. For the music director, a well-written song by the Korites. As, the, as a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, for the living God. I say, when will I be able to appear in God's presence? I cannot eat. I weep day and night. All day long they say to me, where is your God? I will remember and weep. For I was once walking along with the great throng to the temple of God, shouting and giving thanks along with the crowd as we celebrated the holy festival. Why are you depressed, O my soul? Why are you upset? Wait for God, for I will yet again give thanks to my God for his saving intervention. I am depressed, so I will pray to you while I am trapped here in the regions of Upper Jordan, from Hermon to Mount Mizar. One deep stream calls out to another at the sound of your waterfalls, and your billows and waves overwhelm me. By day, the Lord decrees his loyal love, and by night he gives me a song, a prayer to the living God. I will pray to God my high, on my high ridge. Why do you ignore me? Why must I walk around mourning because my enemies oppress me? My enemies taunt, my enemies taunts cut into me to the bone as they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you depressed, O oh my soul? Why are you upset? Wait for God, for I will yet give thanks to my God for his saving intervention. And the Lord allowed his blessing to the reading of his precious word. One thing that's interesting for me, at least when I'm reading in another translation, my mind has memorized it in another translation. And so when I'm reading along, sometimes I lapse back into what I know has been memorized. And so there, there was a little few alterations as we went through there from the actual reading of it from the New English translation. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful to you that you put within your word these words of encouragement and strength 
We're thankful, Father, that you put into your word the struggles of men and women. We're thankful, Father, that you put into your word what life can be like in order that we might understand, that we might grow, that we might mature in our faith and our walk with you. So, Father, help us as we look at this portion of your word. Speak to our hearts, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. John Bunyan. Whenever you hear the name John Bunyan, what does your, your mind first think of? Pilgrim's Progress. That great allegory that uh, John Bunyan wrote back in the 1600s. It's a powerful book. And I bet all of you in this room have read it, I bet, right? Have all of you read Pilgrim's Progress at one point or, or another? Oftentimes we think of it as a children's book. It's not a children's book at all. It has great lessons to teach. In fact, in years gone by, the people who were, didn't have an accumulation of books in their homes, Christians had the Word of God, oftentimes the King James Version, the authorized version, and they had Pilgrim's Progress. Those two books were on the libraries of almost all believers in, in years gone by. It is a powerful allegory. And in that allegory, now, there's a portion, a time when Pilgrim, or Christian as his name became, is walking along with now his companion, Hopeful. And he and Hopeful are on their way to the celestial city. They're on their way to heaven, together, walking along the Pilgrim way. And as they're walking along, at one point, the road became very rough. The rocks were skewed all over the, all over the path, and it was bothering their feet. Their feet were getting sore as they're walking along this path. And then they came along and they saw a little gate and a wall separating. And here was the rough way. And over here, it looked so nice and smooth in what was called bypath meadow. And Christian said to hopeful, let's go over there. It looks, look how easy it is on our feet there. The tender grass that we can walk on. We can, we can make our way along. Oh, but Hopeful said, but, but that's taking us off the path that we're supposed to be on. Oh, but look, it, it just parallels it. It runs right along beside the wall. What can go wrong if we get down there a little ways? We find something, we just hop over the wall again and get back on the path. So he convinced Hopeful and they went through the gate and they got onto Bypath Meadow and they went along for a ways and it seemed so nice. And then darkness began to fall. And then thunder and lightning came and a, and a downpour came and then the road began to get flooded and they could not find their way along. And Christian was now crying out to Hopeful, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry that I brought you this way. That is not the way we should have come. Let's make our way back. I'm leaving out a lot of details. They let their leg back and they started to head their way back to the gate that they had left all that day they'd been walking. And as they're heading back, they couldn't find their way back and they were running out of strength and it got very dark and they laid down on the path to let the evening pass. And the next morning they planned to go back and get on the road. Well, when they woke in the morning, there was a giant that woke them up, shook them and said, what are you doing in my property, on my land? His name was Giant Despair. Giant Despair. And he grabbed them, and he bound them, and he brought them back to his home, Doubting Castle. And he threw them in the dungeon at Doubting Castle. And for five days, they had nothing, no food, no water, nothing. And they were in despair. They were becoming anxious. What are we going to do? How are we going to survive? Giant despair came down after five days. And his wife had instructed him, go down there and beat them. They shouldn't have been on our land in the first place. They went on and giant despair beat them. Every day he beat them. And they became full of despair. They became full of depression. And then one day giant despair came down and said, why? Are you even still living? Just give up. Just take your own life. What good is it? You're never going to get out of here anyway. 
Just take your own life. You are in such despair. You are in such desperation. And there is no way out. And he left them. Strangle yourself, he said. Kill yourself, he said. And he left. And then hopeful and Christian talked among themselves. What should we do? Maybe his counsel is wise. Maybe we should just end it now instead of suffering the beatings and suffering the hardships that we are going through. Let's just end it now. But hopeful said, no, don't you remember the Lord of this place? How he delivered us over and over again? Don't you remember how he delivered you from Apollyon? Don't you remember when you went through the valley of the shadow of death, how he was with you and brought you through to the other side? Don't you remember that he delivered us? And Christian thought for a moment and his eyes widened. I remember. I was given a key called promise. Maybe it'll work on the gate. He reached into his pocket, pulled out the key called promise, and he tried it in the gate of the dungeon, and it turned the, key, turned the lock. They opened the gate, and they went out. Now they're to the gate of the castle itself. He puts the key in, turns it, and the gate opens. But when it opened, the gate led a, a loud creak, and it woke up giant despair. And giant despair came chasing after them as they were fleeing out back to the path from which they came. But his limbs now were feeble and he could not chase them. And they came out back to the path where they ought to have been. You see, back in the 1600s, Bunyan knew about depression. He knew about despair. John Bunyan himself was given over to many bouts of despair, many times of depression in his own life, much fear that he lived through himself. And in his allegory, he expressed it. He showed the despair that he himself had gone through. The scripture is full of men and women who have and go through times of despair that go through times of depression, that wonder if it's better that I had not ever been born. Maybe it's better that I just die. If you even begin right at the beginning, you begin to see fear. As soon as sin came into the garden, there was fear. When he heard, Adam heard the voice of the Lord in the cool of the evening, they hid themselves because they were afraid. And from that time on, fear and anxiety and stress and discord flows through the scripture. Noah, after being the one whom God would use to deliver them from the great flood. When God destroyed all of mankind, he planted a vineyard and became drunk with the wine. Why? Despair. You go on and read through the scripture, and I won't recount them all. There's just not enough time to recount all the different instances. Think of a woman, Hagar. Cast away. Think of Hannah crying in desperation unto God that she might have a child. Think of Saul. Think of David, the writer of these Psalms of lament. All the way down through the scripture. Think of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Of the lamentation cries of despair, cries of anxiety that flow all the way through the word of God. Jonathan Edwards was given over to many times of, of discouragement and failure. That great theologian was given over to, to bouts of depression. Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers oftentimes struggled for months at a time with depression and discouragement in his own life. William Culver 
the great hymn writer, had debilitating paralysis of anxiety throughout his adult life. When C.S. Lewis lost his wife to a violent form of cancer, he went into a darkness that lasted for a long time. This lament of David, as all the laments of Scripture, are, we might say, the common cry of the human heart from generation to generation. Laments are the common cry of the human heart from generation to generation. The cry of men and women, of young and old alike. It is a cry of men and women of faith when we face hard, hard times in our own pilgrimage. When health, health fails, when health fails, when dreams fail, when desires are shattered, our voices lift up to the Lord that we know and we trust. Do they not? Do they not? I know some that are afraid, are so afraid of dying, that are so afraid of dying that they have lost the ability to live and enjoy life. Fear can grip the soul of men and women. So grip them with panic. So grip them with anxiety. I know a young woman that has been so gripped by anxiety and suffering and pain, I mean, emotional pain, that she can't even enjoy life. And she's a young woman. The lament of the Psalms is the cry of the human heart unto God. When discouragement and depression strike as it did David, and I believe this is still a Psalm of David written by the Korahites, given the information, given the, given the lyrics, they wrote this, this song, they wrote the music. When discouragement and depression strike, when it, anxiety and fear grip our minds, we turn as believers to the rock of our salvation. We turn to the rock of our salvation. When we have cause to lament as men and women have done through the centuries and millennium, when we have cause to cry out we will exhibit a desire for God to bring the healing. A desire for God to bring the healing. And we should then exhibit a desire for God in those times of hardship. Jeremiah cries out to God for himself. He cries out to God for the people of Israel, for his people. And you remember these words well when he says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are still not delivered. And oftentimes there's a time of waiting on the Lord. As you see, David even mentioned in this lament of his, a time of waiting. Then he went on to say, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. And oftentimes the pain and suffering of those that we love, that we are close to, touches us as well. Touches our heart. When our wife is suffering, when our husbands are suffering anxiety and stress and hardship, it touches us as well, does it not? 
We cannot simply turn away and say, bother them, to use an old English phrase. But it touches us when our children suffer. It touches us. For Jeremiah, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurting. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. How could this have happened? How could this be? I'm a child of God. They are your children. How can this be? Well, we know the reason, don't we? For the sin of the people who had turned away from God. And then he cries out, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no balm? Is there no ointment or salve in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? Why? Why? So downcast, oh my soul, David says. Why so disquieted within me? Why so downcast? Many go year after year after year without experiencing relief from personal struggles. Year after year, and life moves on. Life moves on, and months become years, and years become decades. And hearts of men and women I have known, and you have known, and maybe you're one of them, cry out to the Lord still, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why have I not felt the healing touch of the Savior in my life? Why? And if you are not among them, then you need to get on your knees. I need to get on my knees and thank the Lord that I am not among them. But they are those you know, and they are those you love that are struggling. Fear, anxiety, loneliness, neglect fill the lives of many and their hearts ache. Their hearts ache with loneliness. Feeling abandoned. And in their loneliness, they hide as it were in the shadows. They hide as it were in the shadows with smiles on their faces, but aching in their souls. Pain in their souls. And they are out there and they are in here. They're in here. And in the midst of struggle, hearts are like the deer, panting for the water. Panting for the water. And the heart looks up to the Lord. The psalmist is panting for God. He desires God in the midst of his distress. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul for you, O oh Lord. In the midst of my suffering, in the midst of my agony, in the midst of my loneliness and despair, I am looking up to you, O oh Lord. Looking up to see your face. And the psalmist compares his need for God for his need for water, which is basic, essential to sustain life both physical and by allegory or by analogy, the spiritual life. We can see the comparison he is making as the deer longs for the water so to satiate his thirst. So men and women among us and out there and people we know, their hearts are longing to be satiated and to be satisfied by the touch of God in their lives. <coughs> By the touch of the Lord in their lives. I need to see you, Lord. I need to see you. 
He says, when can I go and meet with God? When can I go and meet with you? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When shall I see you? When will you appear to me? When will you come into my present situation, Lord? When will I see your face in the midst of this need? The literal translation there is to see God face to face. When will I see his face? When will I see the face of God? Of course, he's not speaking literally, but he desires to see the face of God. And so do people who know the Lord and are in distress and despair and crying out to God in their loneliness and in their anxiety and in their stress. A husband, a wife, children who have gone astray, crying out, when shall God make an appearance in my life? When shall he make an appearance in my situation? You'll see later on, and we probably won't get into it this week, but maybe next week. You see how God has told them, or how he explains in his psalm, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Scott Dunkerton spoke last week at the chapel in Brantford. It was really enjoyable to, to hear him speak. And he spoke on waiting. He spoke of Abraham's life. And how many years, 99 years into his 100th year when Isaac was born, that he had to wait for the promise of God to be fulfilled. Did he not long for the son of promise? Did Sarai not long to have a child of her own being barren for 90 years? Was there not depth of longing there? But there was also a time of waiting. Wait on the Lord, for I will yet praise him, David says. And was there not praise from Sarah and from Abraham when God fulfilled his promise? But it was a long wait. Do we trust him? Do we trust him in the long long wait he david desires to see god intervene he desires to see god's face he desires to see him intervening in the situation the heart of a believer our hearts as those who know the savior we know where the balm is found we know where the balm is found, but how to apply it sometimes evades us. How do we apply it? How are we seeking the physician to apply the healing that we need? I need to see your face, O oh Lord. I need to feel your presence. You long for that? Day after day in your life, whether you are going through stress, whether you're going through hardships, whether you're going through marital issues, whether you're going through whatever it is you're going through, do not you long, was that a proper statement? Do you not long to sense the presence of the Lord with you? Don't you? Don't you? Oftentimes you don't feel it. But that doesn't mean that he is not there. Even in the songs we sang this morning, there was a, a hint of, of an unsureness of the Lord's presence. An unsureness. Will you be here? I need you every hour. But are you there every hour? He is. He is. And whether we sense him or not, he is there. He is here. He is in your life. But we long to feel his presence and see his face, as it were. All of us know. All of us here know. Those of us who know the Lord, we understand in the core of our being why we should desire God 
in the midst of our trial. So that we don't go on bypass meadow and try to make it on our own, which seems like an easier path. But to endure the hard way. Because the end is life everlasting. Enduring the hard way. But we know we desire to see God in the midst of our crisis. It's because we know that God alone is able to deliver us. He alone is able to deliver. And in the core of our being, we know that. We know it. He alone can apply the salve to our hearts and souls that we so need. And when everything around us is falling apart, God alone is the rock on which we can stand. He is a sure anchor in the midst of the storm. This song found in the anthem hymnal says this, and I quote the song, song, Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm, when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. It shall never be removed. When my sails have all been torn and they can't catch the wind anymore, he is my sure anchor. He is my sure anchor and he shall never be removed. I read on a placemat of all places. I read on a placemat. I think I shared this here with you last year, but I read on a placemat was that we were staying in the Bahamas, which is a logical place to read this on a placemat. But it was in the little house we were staying on. And it said, you cannot control the winds, but you can adjust the sails. The winds that are coming into your life that might tear your sails. The winds that are coming into your life, the hardships, you cannot control them. And the Lord will allow hardship to come. He will ordain hardship to come. But you can adjust your sails. You can put up a new sail. And you can let it catch the wind of his grace and his mercy. And sail through the hard time. He's there. The wind of his spirit is still there. I think I can safely say that we know that the better we comprehend the Lord, the better our comprehension of the Lord Jesus, the more we know of God through his word and our experiences with him, the deeper our understanding and our relationship with him grows and the more we will trust him. Is it so? The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. He is there. And the more that we know him, the deeper our anchor goes, the stronger we will be against the trials. We can accept the trials. Dear friends, and I mentioned these last week, again from the islands, a woman is dying of ALS, dying. She knows she's dying. Will there be anxiety? and stress, and pain, and anguish, yes. Will there be loss of hope? Perhaps, but in the end, she knows that her Redeemer lives. 
She knows her Redeemer lives. She knows that she will go from this life into that life. She cannot change her circumstances. She cannot change the wind, but she's learning to adjust her sails as she goes through the hard time. And when we get to know him deeper through those hardships and trials, which sometimes it's the only way we can get to know him deeper. And he knows that. We will begin to recognize that he alone is able to meet our need. He alone will care for us. And as we do, when we lament, we will exhibit a desire for God himself to be near us. That song continues. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, while the tempest rages on, when temptation claims the battle, and it seems the night has won. Deeper still then goes the anchor, though I justly stand accused, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. What peace and hope we can have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If we believe that God is for us, then you believe that, don't you? You believe that God is for you. And if God is for you, who can stand against you? Can the forces of evil can the wickedness in heavenly places? Who can stand against us? We know that it is God who has justified us. We know that it is he who has delivered us from destruction, who has delivered us from the pit. Who can bring a charge against us? Christ has died for us. He has risen. He's at the right hand of God, the Father. And he is making intercession for you. He is making intercession for me. He's standing between me and God. He's standing between you and God. And he is your advocate when you fail. And he is your intercession when you're going through the hard times of trial and difficulty. Your name is on his lips your name is on his lips so then who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation and hardship do it no scripture tells us no will our desire distress or depression do it no you cannot separate us from the love of god which is in Christ Jesus. Will our own personal famine, our own personal loneliness, our own personal fear be able to accomplish it? No, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, your Savior. And in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I need you. Oh, how I need you. Every hour, I need you. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee, moment by moment, I'm kept in his love, moment by moment, he's with me, he's with you. So in your times of despair, in your times of anxiety, in times of stress within your own family, times of stress and anxiety, that happens within a marriage. Know that the Lord is with you and he will never abandon you. 
I will share this story once again. And I hope it will be the last time I will share it here with you. Because you've probably heard it multiple times now. And my wife is looking at me and saying, oh no, not that story again. Because I have shared it multiple times. When we went back to the Philippines in 2000, I believe it was, after a furlough at home, I was continuing to just seek the Lord as to what he would have from me, what he would have for me. And I always enjoyed those times alone with the Lord while I would walk. I'm one that can't sit still very easily. And I will walk and I will pray. And I was walking and praying when I got back and heaven felt like brass. It felt as though the Lord was not hearing my prayer, was not responding to my voice. I felt as though the Lord was not walking with me. I began to wonder if I was where the Lord wanted me to be. I was wondering if I should have come back to the Philippines after, after that year of furlough, did he need me back there still? Where was I going to be? And, and I felt like the Lord just wasn't hearing me. I did not have that sense of his presence with me that I so enjoyed. And it went on for weeks. I confessed every sin I could possibly think of that I might have done. Not even knowing if I had done it or not, but I confessed it. And it still was like brass. And then one day, it broke through. And you remember the story now, don't you? You're listening to me say it again. One day it broke through. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And you know what I mean when I say that. He spoke to my heart. He caused me to remember do you remember before you left to come back to the Philippines? You said to me that you wanted to experience me in a way that you had not yet experienced. And over the course of these months, you have experienced that. Because whether you sense my presence or not, I have promised you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Do not depend on whether you feel it or not. I am with you. Oh, my brothers and sisters, there are some times when we don't feel it, but never forget, he is with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with you. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. <clears throat> for the Psalms that David wrote, the desire that he had, the hunger and thirst he had for you. In the midst of his trial, in the midst of his hardship, he desired to see you come in and intervene. He desired to see you come, to see your face, to experience you again in his life. And yet that did not come immediately. And he waited on you. And men would cry out to him, where's your God now? But he knew that you were there. Whether he felt you or experienced you, he knew where to go. And he went into your presence to cry out to you. So Father, we pray for each one of us here we all go through times of stress and anxiety. We all go through hardships. We all go through illnesses. We all go through times of depression and discouragement. And so it has been for millennium with, your, with men and women, even your people. But Father, through it all, we learn to trust in Jesus. We learn to trust in God. Through it all, may you be our strength in times of need, for we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.
Yeah, yeah, because like, like, like yesterday I was practicing on the keyboard, and, and um, I had, I had like a little bit of here, and there's a chair here, and like, here's the keyboard, and he wants to play the keyboard. So in, in a few seconds, I, I didn't even see what he did. He was up here, hitting the pan, bang on the keyboard. So, how did you, so I'm saying to myself, you have the courage to go, it's like I said, when you want something, but you won't. Uh, he doesn't, you know, you won't walk on your own. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's that, it has to be that one thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want that, I want that, you know? Yeah. Hey. Motivation. Motivation, yeah. yeah. So, motivation. Yeah. 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 How you been now? How's your week been now? Yeah, so there's I love it. It's like it's like two days in a row. That's kind of wild. And the windows went up. I was still in the I don't remember. This is the warmest April I've ever experienced in my life. I was telling her, and I heard it broke world records. This is phenomenal. Man, I was enjoying it. Now, I said, I don't know how all of April is like. I think we might have a hot summer. You know? Yeah, so we'll see. I was like, wow, this is great. Yeah. I was surprised. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, but we were happy with it. But enjoy it when you take advantage of what it does come. Yeah, you know, so. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes. <laughs> 80 years old. Um, and you take a, like, a random thing and you're like, oh, you need to get that. Yeah, we're going to do Yeah, 